Okay, uh, so um, my name is Joanne Chang. Uh, I'm a developer at ThoughtBot out in Denver, Colorado. Um, for those of you who don't know where Denver is, it's a red dot in the middle of North America. Um, that's where I am. And this is the rest of our offices. Um, so I mostly do web development with Ruby on Rails and a little bit of JavaScript um, and other various technologies that come our way. But um, I've been really fascinated by the field of data visualization in the pa uh, for the past several years. Um, data visualization, simply defined, is just the study of graphical representation of data. But um, it's associated these days with these really rich, interactive um, data uh, web applications that let you explore data and see data in different ways. Um, but I think to understand uh, data visualization, we need to look at a couple of early print examples. Um, so this is a bar graph uh, of import and export quantities of Scotland by uh, an artist named William, uh, a man named William Playfair. Um, he released a book called Commercial and Political Atlas in 1786. Uh, during that time, um, data, was only data was mostly presented in dense tables of numbers, and uh, Playfair decided to use shapes instead of um, numbers because he thought people can compare things a lot easier with shapes. And uh, I think he was right. Um, because, of this, uh, because of this book and other books he wrote, uh, he inspired other uh, interesting representations of data. And this is one of my favorite uh, data visualizations. Um, this is a map of the Soho District of London. Um, it's a map of the Chloria outbreak uh, in London in 1854. When, the, when this outbreak happened, um, there was a theory that uh, all the diseases and all the death was caused by pollution or bad air. But um, Snow's theory was that it was caused by a contaminated water pump, particularly this one. Um, and so to prove this theory, he plotted out little um, black rectangles, which are basically little mini bar graphs on each street that represent the number of deaths uh, per address. And because of this, he was able to prove to health officials that um, to, he was able to convince health officials to actually investigate that water pump. So if this data were presented in a different way, perhaps in just a regular bar chart, uh, it probably it may not have had the same effect as this map does. Um, and so I love this map because it caused people to take action and change the way they look at um, the same set of data. And so with these two print examples, I wanted to show that sometimes you need to present data a little bit differently. And as web developers, uh, our nature is to just present data. We get data from. Um, various other services, whether it's a database or another service, and we present it in a more palatable way. And so how can we share data creatively on the web when we need to? We can use images like in the print examples before, but we live in an age of dynamic web applications where data updates differently. And there's a lot of really well-made configuration-based graphing libraries out there, but we're restricted to predefined graphics and interactions. We lose that creative element to visualizations that we get uh, through pencil and paper. They're also really difficult to style, and they stick out on a really well-designed page. Um, I've worked with a lot of designers who don't like high charts because um, it takes them a very long time to get it the way they wanted to because they have to go into JavaScript. And um, they also, uh, it also sticks out. Um, they spend a lot of time designing a page, and then they have to look at something that someone else designed. So this is where D3.js comes in. Uh, we need an expressive way to present data on the web when we need it. Um, and so D3.js is a JavaScript framework or DSL uh, written by Mike Bostock, who is currently of the New York Times. Um, D3 is usually associated with making graphs and graphics. And I know this is a talk about data visualization, but um, it's not a visualization framework. It's really just a, like a flexible way to manipulate the DOM with JavaScript arrays and objects. And when you need to be creative um, with your communication on the web, D3.js is an amazing tool. Um, uh, so to show you uh, how to get, um, to show you the kind of the basics of J D3, I had this little example. Um, it's going to take me a little, little while. So I have this mostly empty. Oh, that's sorry. One second.
Can you all see? Is that... OK, cool. Um, so I have this mostly empty HTML page, um, and this mostly em empty JavaScript page. And um, to get started, um, I have this CSV of planet information. You have all the planet names. Whoops. Uh, you have all the planet names, um, the diameter of each planet, and the average distance from the sun for each planet. Um, and I want to basically create the solar system with D3 on this page. So I'm going to do that um, with D3 and with uh, creating every planet with SVG. And so we only have a body tag in this HTML file. So I'm going to create um, an SVG container to contain this visualization I'm going to make. So we now have an SVG container. And what I did in the code, um, whoops. So that first line, I just, that first line, I just made a selection uh, on the body tag um, just by passing in a selector to this select method. Um, that's just going to return the first matching, um, select, uh, first matching selection. And then I append an SVG element to it. Um, and now that SVG variable, or I should call this SVG. Um, now this SVG container variable, um, the selection refers to this SVG element. Um, because when we append an element, it returns the element that we just appended. Um, and that means when we call methods after append, um, we can call methods after append to change the attributes of that SVG element. Um, so I can change the height and the width. Um, and add a class to this. And that changes in our DOM. Um, now we need to get the data from the CSV file that I showed you here. Um, D3 has a lot of helper methods that let you um, make an HTTP request and then get the data back. And it also parses it in a more friendly way to work with. So So with this method, what I just did was I just made an HTTP request to planets.csv, um, and then I get a callback function with um, the CSV parsed and uh, the CSV parsed and easy to work with. So now I'm going to actually draw the planets for every um, every row in that uh, CSV file. Oh, whoops. Thank you. Um, so now each of these circles represents uh, a row in that CSV file that I just referred to. And let me explain what I just did, because I just wrote a lot of code. Um, so on line 12, um, I took that SVG container that we created 
um, on line five, and I selected um, an element that doesn't exist yet. Uh, it's kind of a placeholder for, um, uh, I made a selection, and it's going to be a placeholder for the elements I'm going to create. Um, on line 13, I bound the data to that selection that I made in the previous line. And then on line 14, I entered the data. And what that's going to do is it's going to call methods after enter um, for every element in the array, which means for every element in that planet's array, um, I'm going to append a circle to the SVG uh, container. I'm going to set the attribute of the uh, um, y position for every circle to be half the height, um, setting the radius to 10 pixels. And I'm going to set the x position so that they're just kind of lined up in a row like that. And as you can see, I can either pass in a static value to um, these, this attribute function um, as a second parameter, or I could pass in a function. And when I pass in the function, I get two other parameters. Um, I get uh, d refers to the element in the array that I'm on, and i refers to the index. Um, and so now we have these nine black circles, and they don't really mean anything. They don't really represent the planets. So I want to change the size of each of the circle um, using the diameter that I have in my CSV file. Um, so let me explain what I just wrote. Um, so D3 has a lot of other helper modules um, that let you find and explore your data. So for in, on line 12, I found the max of, I found the biggest uh, diameter, I, um, I found the, sorry, I found the biggest radius that I had in my data set um, just with this D3 max method, and I passed that in to create a scale. So on line 15, that's just kind of an initializer for a new linear scale, um, which is the mapping we want between, uh, we want a linear relationship between the radius of the planet and the number of pixels that show up on the screen. Um, the domain is the number that we're going to pass into this function, this planet radius scale function. Um, that's going to be the actual radius of the planet. And the range represents the number that we want back. This is going to be the number in pixels. Um, so on line, 25, when I call that planet radius scale function that I um, generated on line, on line 15, um, I'm going to I'm gonna get a value that uh, maps correctly to the scale that we want. And so it displays data in, like this, in um, the correct scale and the correct mapping. Um, and then we can do the same thing for We can do the same thing for the planet distance, because we have that uh, distance from the sun um, attribute.
So that's kind of our solar system a little bit. Um, you can kind of see that everything is now relative um, and moved in the correct exposition. Um, and we did that just by creating a scale like we did for the radius. Um, another thing we can do, um, we have the name of each planet. And what I did, or what I can do, is change the class of, or add a class, um, add a class to each circle that is a name of the planet. Um, that doesn't do anything now, but I created um, I created a CSS file that would color the planets accordingly, and so we were able to do that because D3 lets us just add classes whenever um, to elements that we want. Um, In addition to this, we also can get, um, we also can change the positions using uh, transformations. Um, sorry, we could even also use animation transitions. Um, D3 also gives us that capability. Um, and all I did was basically change an attribute and call transition and set a delay um, before changing that attribute on line 38 to 43. So, um, that's kind of an introduction to D3, um, just kind of the most basic, uh, basic parts of D3. Um, there's a lot of benefits to creating visualizations in this style. Um, it's a lot more flexible than um, drawing things with traditional um, drawing libraries. Notice how I never called a method called circle, or I never um, set a color um, directly using a method in the D3 API. Um, it's designed to be really flexible and not be bound to any specific browser technology. Um, and you, people have used uh, D3 to draw divs and shape divs and also to draw on canvas. Um, and because you have such, it's also really easy to style because you're, control, you're controlling what classes are getting set on each of the elements. And um, because you have so much control over uh, your graphics, you can also get a lot of performance benefits, um, potentially, if you're doing things correctly. But there's a couple of downsides. Um, mostly, uh, there's a, because it's so flexible, um, you also have to create your own mobile views and responsive views. So you have to be the one um, to listen for um, whether the browser's resizing or detect the browser size, make sure your visualizations are good for um, smaller browsers, smaller browser windows or mobile views. And there's a lot of also potential uh, performance problems when you create too many SVG elements, which is really easy to do. Um, for instance, I had this idea of creating this arc diagram in D3 uh, to display um, pull requests on uh, pull requests and issues on Rails um, because I thought it'd be a really cool way to view um, GitHub issues. But unfortunately, this is what happened, and this is 13,000 issues uh, on GitHub. Um, so this was this performed poorly, and then when I tried to add mouse events to everything, that, that wasn't smart. Um, so the theme of this conference is the future of JavaScript. And I was a little hesitant to talk about D3 because this technology has been around for a few years. But, and development started even way before D3 um, was re officially released. Uh, but technically, its API is designed to adapt to new browser, browser technologies by not binding the user to any specific um, a specific type of graphics. And more importantly, the flexibility of D3 to create uh, graphics allows for more interesting ways to communicate. 
Um, so for example, the idea of this planet's visualization came from this article that, um, that was released somewhat recently. Um, this is root, oh, this is. So this was, um, uh, this was, sorry, a visualization uh, released by the New York Times um, last year, and I really, uh, I, this is kind of one of my favorites. Um, what I really love about it is it uses um, a vocabulary that you know, you kind of know that this is um, planets that are moving, and also it uses scales that are familiar to us um, rather than discrete numbers. And um, you can also see like crazy outliers as well really easily. Um, and what is also, um, all the data for that visualization was populated through this table, so it kind of goes back to that um, original print example of taking numbers and translating them into something more readable and more friendly for humans. Um, so I think the future of data visualization on the web um, lies with the creative ways that people use uh, existing technology, and D3JS gives developers and designers um, both the expressiveness to be creative and flexibility to make use of um, new and upcoming browser technologies we'll have. Um, and that is it. Have you ever, oh, hello. <laughs> have you ever tried uh, combining D3 with other libraries like Backbone or Angular? Have you, how, how did you find that? Yes, um, so I've used it with Backbone. Um, I, I actually had, um, I did a little, so Backbone, it's, it's okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I actually, I played a little bit with Angular um, a couple of weeks ago, actually. Um, and what I really like about uh, Angular is because you, you have like these data attributes that you can attach. It's really easy to attach that to um, like the D3 objects that you're creating uh, because you're setting attributes all the time. Um, but for the most part, uh, if I'm doing a lot of requests, um, to other services, then I will use something like Backbone or Angular um, to handle that rather than the D3 methods. If I'm only making one request, then I'll usually just uh, use whatever D3 has or even just jQuery. Next question. Anyone? One question I've wondered with D3, I've played with it a couple of times. Um, where do you find the best place to go to learn is? Because it can, feel quite, um, it can feel quite complex. It can feel like to try and achieve a lot, there's quite a lot of code to write. And you just showed actually how it, it's quite simple when you break it into pieces. But are there any specific resources or places that you would go to on the web to, to read about it or learn about it? Um, actually, I don't have internet, sorry. Um, there's a really good book, I think recently released by O'Reilly. Okay. Um, I think it's called, it's D3, it's like kind of an introduction to D3. Mm -hmm. I, don't know the name of the okay. book off the top we can of my find head, it. Yeah. but um, it was released, I think, around last year, I think okay. June. Um, it was really great because it broke down uh, kind of how to create D3 visualizations and also like parts of the DOM and the introduction to SVG and okay, yeah, awesome, thank you. Any last questions before coffee break? No, awesome. Thanks again.